Yet Abraham Lincoln, fearing for the nation, fearing the war with the South, suspended the writ of habeas corpus on thousands of occasions, arresting people without charges, without lawyers, and without access to the courts. We come down to that next war, the First World War, the Espionage and Sedition Acts, another period of great fear of war in Europe and fear at home. No greater a figure than Eugene Debs, great socialist leader, was arrested, charged, and convicted for giving a speech in Canton, Ohio, that was far less seditious than the speech I'm giving right now. And when Deb's case came before the United States Supreme Court, that great American jurist, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., writing for a unanimous court, upheld the conviction of Debs and two other anarchists and socialists in separate cases, using the clear and present danger standard, condemned and upheld Debs's 10-year sentence for giving a speech. Holmes would go through a transformation in the year of 1919. He would meet with people like Felix Frankfurter and Zachariah Chafee at Harvard and others, and by the fall of 1919, he had changed his mind. A Civil War veteran, wounded three times. Initially, he couldn't understand why we could tolerate free speech when young men were dying in Europe. But by the end of 1919, he understood that in times of war, in times of conflict, that is exactly when you need a robust and powerful First Amendment and the right of dissent and free speech. And in the Abrams case involving a group of Jewish anarchists who threw pamphlets out a factory window on the Lower East Side of New York, Holmes and Brandeis, the first Jew on the Supreme Court, both dissented from the majority. But it would take 50 years for that view to hold as the majority view of the United States Supreme Court. And then we come down, and looking at this audience, within our lifetimes, during World War II, when upwards of 120,000 Japanese Americans were torn from their homes and offices up and down this West Coast. No hearings, no individualized suspicion, no lawyers, just because of their nationality. Two-thirds of those people were American citizens. Why do I say that? Not because the other third didn't have their constitutional rights equally violated. The Constitution in this area protects persons, not just citizens. The word citizen doesn't even appear in the Constitution until the amendments regarding voting in the 14th Amendment. Every one of those persons were protected by the Constitution, but were not protected by the Constitution. I, man I mentioned the two-thirds to remind us of Nemo. Because once a government out of fear and hysteria moves against certain groups in America, it will not stop just because someone in that group is an American citizen. It would take years later for a commission to be appointed to look into the Japanese American internment. And the independent commission found that three things led to that dark chapter in American history, racism, war hysteria, and a lack of political courage. <clears throat> Think of those factors today, racism, war hysteria, and a lack of political courage. And we could continue this brief history down to COINTELPRO, to McCarthyism, to Watergate, and down to the present day and the period since 9-11. This is an ugly history of America. It's rarely the history taught in American history books, but it's a true history. It's a critical history. It's a history we need to learn from 
or else as we have seen, we will be condemned to repeat it. In most cases, it would take generations for people to realize what had happened in each of those dark chapters. The challenge for us today, for each of us, as we will talk about action items later, is can we make this a courageous chapter in American history? When instead of waiting for our children and our grandchildren and historians after us to wring their hands and look back on us, in our time, while this was happening, while people's rights were being violated in this country, while Muslims and South Asians and others who were targeted by this country have been rounded up and subjected to cruel and unusual punishment, while rights have been violated here, and while policies have been adopted here as human rights have been violated around the world, can we call those to account who are responsible for those violations? And will we do that and make that part of our daily work and our time and our effort from now until we see each one of those war criminals held accountable. Yes, we will. Justice Robert Jackson, United States Supreme Court Justice, took leave from the court to be the special prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials. And you'll hear more about the Nuremberg principles, but I discovered a new book called The Nuremberg Legacy, which examines Nuremberg and then compares it to what's going on today. And I was impressed that Robert Jackson said that you must put no man on trial under forms of judicial proceedings if you are not willing to see him freed if not proven guilty. He said that we must never forget that the record on which we judge these defendants today is the same record on which history will judge us tomorrow. What we are doing around the world is the record on which we will be judged. The degree to which we are torturing detainees in Afghanistan, Iraq, Guantanamo Bay, and in dark, black CIA prisons we can't even yet identify. I shudder to think when the full story is displayed before the world, the degree of anti-Americanism fueled by this kind of torture and abuse is immense, and we have yet to begin to fully appreciate it. It depends on why the president thinks he needs to do that. It depends on why the president thinks he needs to do that. John Yu asked, if it would constitute illegal torture in violation of American law and international law for the, <clears throat> for the testicles of a child of a detainee to be crushed to coerce the detainee into answering the interrogation. John Yu's answer was, it depends on why the president thinks he needs to do that. That was his answer then, and virtually less colorfully, and unfortunately under weak and unprepared questioning yesterday before the House Judiciary Committee, I dare say, that was his answer yesterday. Because asked forthrightly, can we bury a detainee alive? John Yu essentially said, 
It depends. 